Uh, so I'm Andrew Thaler, and I run the marine science and conservation blog, Southern Fried Science. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to this workshop. I'm going to talk a lot about narratives and how we can turn our scientific studies into uh, narrative stories that, that can really connect with people. And so I'm going to start by telling the story of how Southern Fried Science uh, sort of conquered a small subset of the online ocean science world. Um, yes, I just said focus on narratives. Uh, so before I, I dive into that, I'd like to point out that um, in the current online ecosystem, there are two kinds of um, activities that are being called science blogging right now. Uh, one is journalists who are very interested in science writing about science. And these are people like Ed Young and David Dobbs and uh, Brian Switek who are very, very excellent writers who are interested in science and want to write and blog about science. Uh, there are also scientists who are interested in becoming better writers, who want to uh, hone their craft, who want to spread their message, who want to share their research with the world. And so they've taken to the blogging platforms to also write about science. And from an outsider perspective, from the perspective of your audience, the general public, uh, most people don't really know the difference between the two, but obviously there, there's, a, there's quite a tremendous difference. Journalists have a, a separate set of values, a separate set of ethics, a separate set of goals from scientists when our goal is really to talk about what we're doing and why it matters to us. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that there's this divide. The communities themselves overlap, um, and if you, if you get into science blogging and really, really kind of run with it, you'll end up interacting with a lot of the, the journalist side of science blogging as well. But it's important to recognize that there is a distinction between the two, and that when you begin shaping and crafting your own online writing, um, that you don't try to replicate the model of uh, journalists doing science writing if your goal is to be a scientist writing online. Um, so with that being said, let's dive into the history of Southern Fried Science. This is the original uh, Southern Fried Science webpage from back when it launched, which was on Thanksgiving Day 2007. Uh, quite a while ago now. Uh, and I originally launched this site on one of the free blogging platforms, WordPress.com, which is a really nice, uh, simple, easy to use uh, set of software. Uh, and I started this project uh, not really with any kind of grand goal in mind. I had just started my graduate student career. Um, I wanted to become a better writer. I wanted an outlet where I could write about issues in marine science that weren't necessarily completely related to my thesis, but were still interesting to me. And more importantly, I wanted to hone my craft. I wanted to work on my communication skills. I wanted to get better at telling stories to the general public. So I launched this site, and uh, for about the first two years, three years, it was uh, a fairly inconsequential website, which is how it goes. It takes um, for to get a, a blog really off the ground to the point where you have a reliable audience. It really takes about four to five years of investment uh, in content. So it was a, a long slog. Uh, this is what the site looks like now. Um, you can see it's, it's a very, very different format. Um, and this gets into sort of an important key concept. When you are um, a science blogger as opposed to a science writer or um, just a writer or a journalist. When you are a blogger and you're running a platform like this, you're also a publisher. Um, so things like layout are important. Um, paying attention to how your website looks, paying attention to the structure, the usability, the flow of the site. Those are all important things that you have to think about. And often if you go and look at a lot of science blogs out there, they don't pay a tremendous amount of attention to the format. And that is, um, a very, very easy way to lose your audience. Uh, if your site is hard to navigate, people aren't going to explore it. Uh, if your content is hard to read, people aren't going to read it. And you can see a couple of the key differences here. This very first one, this was kind of the standard, uh, the state of the art in 2007. Uh, the kind of two column, very basic, um, the, this column over here would have had just information about all the writers and frankly, too, too much information about the writers. Um, and you're kind of very basic size 12 font. There's your title, read the article. Isn't that great? And then a couple of uh, topic things at the top. And that was fine for 2007, but the internet changed and people started using tablets to read the news and people started using touchscreen computers and people started reading on their phones. So we had to adapt. And if you look at the, 
at the newer layout, the font is huge. It's, I think it's size 24 on the main page right now. It's designed to be immediately readable and easy to read. Uh, as soon as you log on, you don't have to change anything in the settings. Um, we got rid of all the informational columns. There's information, there's like links down at the bottom that you can get to. Um, easy informational links, but all of the the main site now is completely focused on the actual article rather than any of the superfluous stuff. And that's really kind of a design change that sort of evolved over time and changed in conjunction with the way that people use the internet change. Um, so I'm starting with that because that's kind of the sort of basic thing that I'll completely forget to mention if we really get going and talking about writing because this is secondary to the writing process but integral to the blogging process. Um, Add, um, I'm, I, I, I like when people just ask questions in the middle of talks like this, um, so feel free to, to jump in if you have a question. Are uh, you still on uh, WordPress? I am not. So WordPress is, like science blogging is two things, WordPress is also two things. Um, there's the free website WordPress that lets you host your blog there, uh, and it's really easy to use. It doesn't have a lot of flexibility to it. But there's also a software package called WordPress that is the actual... Uh, software that runs the free blogging platform, and you can you can just get that software, put it on your own website, and edit it and change it however you want. So we are still on the WordPress software package, but we are not on the WordPress website. Um, so this blog, so the first time I'm going to jump back and forth. I don't know why I'm a little disorganized this morning, but um, the very first article that really took off. Um, on our blog was this one, How to Brew Beer in a Coffee Maker Using Only Materials Commonly Found on a Modestly Sized Oceanographic Research Vessel. It's a fantastic title, which immediately captures a lot of people's imagination. It tells you exactly what we're going to say. Um, but in the early days of Southern Fried Science, um, we had one very clear goal. Um, and I say we, when the blog started, it was just me. After about four months, it became me and my colleague David Schiffman, who writes about sharks. And then about a year after that, Amy Freitag, who's a citizen science uh, researcher, uh, joined the team. Uh, but our original goal was very simply, we wanted to humanize science. Uh, we wanted people to connect with scientists as people, rather than just kind of these nebulous, white lab-coated things somewhere that issue edicts from, from their, their big papers. Um, which is sort of the kind of thing you'd expect a first-year graduate student to think is what, what they should really be doing with their time. Um, <laughs> uh, so our, our first, our, our, you know, our early articles were things like this, um, which, by the way, you can do this, um, and the beer tastes absolutely terrible. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is awful, but I, I have word that the guys on the... Uh, um, oh, which one? One of, the, one of the Antarctic research vessels tried it, and it was just undrinkable. Um, so we, we kind of ran along with this theme. Um, uh, I did one on how to build a canoe from scratch on a graduate student stipend. I'm kind of just going to highlight some of the, the, the bigger um, traffic articles, the ones that really struck a chord with people, to give you an idea of the kind of content we write about. And this one was very, you'll see the how-to kinds of articles um, do very well. Um, recently, there's been a lot of fear-mongering about what the Fukushima nuclear disaster is going to do to the U.S. West Coast with some uh, not-so-great science coming out of it. Um, so we did an article kind of bunking some of the biggest uh, fallacious claims about that, and that one's huge. I think this is probably the third most read article we've ever written. It's probably gotten about a million unique visitors just on its own. Um, so, so that was big, and that struck a chord because it was uh, an immediate thing. People were concerned about it. There wasn't a lot of information about it, and there was a ton of disinformation about it. Um, and one of the really important things about this is that um, when you are a scientist blogger, and I say scientist blogger just to separate that from the science bloggers who are journalists, um, and you a very specific expertise in a very particular field, um, you have the ability to respond very quickly to uh, pseudoscience, to nutty stuff, to crazy things people say on the internet without needing to do a ton of background research, right? Like, if a journalist had to go in and do, um, and Fukushima is a bad example of that because we actually had to do a ton of research for that because none of us are radiation experts, um, but if a journalist had to go in and debunk all of the claims about Fukushima, it would take them significantly more time than if a radiation expert 
had the exact same set of claims and could do it so that you can catch the, um, the same news cycle as the original article. So when something came out, and I think the original article was like 28 signs that the West Coast is being absolutely fried with nuclear radiation from Fukushima. It was a totally crazy article. Um, but it was shared something like 60,000 times on Facebook by the time it got to us. Like I'm sure a lot of you probably saw it on your feed somewhere um, from that family member. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everyone knows who I'm talking about. Everyone has one. Um, but, um, but it dominates the cycle. If, if, if the first 60,000 shares are all just, oh my god, look at this article, this is horrifying, and there's no content out there to be, for someone to come in and be like, well, actually, it's not true, and here's the article about it, then you kind of lose this, uh, you, you lose the, the wave created by the first article, you lose the ability to educate from people who are interested in that topic because these things move quickly. Uh, the news cycle moves very quickly. So having experts on hand that run their own blogs where they can immediately respond to things like this is, is very important. I think it's actually probably the uh, most important service that scientists, bloggers can do um, beyond just educating uh, the general public, but responding to specific events um, in real time and being able to address them as they come up. Uh, we cover other ridiculous things. Um, this is the third most read article on our website and it's all about teacup pigs. Um, not marine science focused, does have a conservation focus, also has, a, has an animal welfare focus because there actually aren't teacup pigs. Um, I'm not going to dive into a ton of details about this, but basically it's getting really popular for people to buy tiny pigs. Tiny pigs turn into 400 pound hogs. Uh, and then they dump them at animal shelters, and the animal shelters get full of pigs, and then they send them to us, and we barbecue them. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna pause on that one. Um, so we had an article about this, and if you if you go all the way down, it actually gets into um, kind of the phylogeny and the physiology of actual tiny pigs, which are uh, this very very small. Uh, monogenus in India that's got something like 120 surviving individuals, and they are legitimately very, very tiny pigs, but they're a conservation issue. So we, we do this whole uh, entertaining story, we connect it to a lot of pop culture, and then you come down to the end and it's talking about, you know, conservation implications for actual wild uh, small pigs, um, and you know, if you really want to put $10,000 into a pet teacup pig, which is what they sell for, um, why not just give that money to the conservation trust that's working to preserve the last surviving uh, member of this tiny pig genus? Um, and we actually heard back from the, uh, the conservation trust in India. The guy who ran it got in touch with us and said they had gotten about um, seven or eight donations uh, from that article, which was enough to fund their project for a couple of months. Uh, so we thought that was really cool. We liked that. Um, Again, with the experts can immediately respond to things. Uh, this was a very recent one uh, in which uh, someone thought they found a the Loch Ness Monster on Apple Maps. And it wasn't the Loch Ness Monster. It was a boat wake. But it was a little weird because of the way like satellite images get stitched together. So one of our writers happens to be an expert on satellite imagery. So I was like, nope, that is a boat. And we were able to, we actually caught this news cycle within an hour of the very first article going up, and so uh, other than the first, yay, look, we found the Loch Ness Monster article, every other article about this, and things like the Loch Ness Monster go crazy on the internet. Um, but the very first article, other than the very first article, every single newspaper article about this, which we counted to be about 60, mentioned this post in addition to the, hey, look, people thought the Loch Ness Monster. So by, by catching that, that first wave of the news cycle, we were able to make sure that the information spread with the disinformation and the separate thing. Yeah? And so, um, if it's appropriate to address this later, because it would take too long, you can tell me. But, so it seems very critical to have a successful blog to jump on the news cycle right away. So you would have to have a way to survey the best news outlets that would get you there. What's your strategy for that? Uh, building relationships with journalists. Um, okay. So I was saying, you know, there's journalists who like writing about science, um, and the communities overlap completely, and they overlap primarily on Twitter. Um, but it's really about building relationships, having um, 
for lack of a better term, a stable of journalists that come to you for scientific information. Um, so that, that comes into the whole sort of building your audience slowly over time and reaching out to them. At this point, Southern Fried Science is aggregated by Google News. So anything we write about the Loch Ness Monster that happens at the same time as this showed up in all the Google News result results and all the big like Eureka Alert news feeds that a lot of journalists are mining for information. Um, but that, that comes with building things up over time. Um, when you have kind of a smaller platform and you need to get information out, uh, the secret is to email people who have bigger audiences and tell them what's going on. Uh, and that works very effectively. I love it when people email stuff to me and they're like, hey, I wrote this. Can we help get it on? I'm like, yes. No, I don't have to write it. <laughs> and it's usually someone who's got more expertise than me because as we'll slowly see, my real expertise is in the deep sea, um, which we'll get into the whole topic of when you shouldn't blog. Um, <laughs> Very important, the stuff where you shouldn't blog. And I, so a lot of the articles I'm highlighting s seem a little fluffier, and that's definitely because they are. Um, the stuff that goes really big on the internet is unfortunately always going to be kind of Loch Ness Monster, Teacup Pig, the fluffier stuff. Um, and it's, you know, it's really hard to do that. Um, Speaking of horrifyingly bad misinformation being spread by major media outlets, um, this is the most read article on Southern Fridays to date. Um, this is the entire article. <laughs> just, just to give you an idea, there's a couple of links below it, and we, we kept putting more links in as it gets linked to, but this, this article on its own gets about 2,000 hits every day. Um, because Animal Planet is huge. Discovery Communications is, is huge. It's a major media network. And they have, in the last few years, made a little transition towards not quite true, but we want people to think it's actually a documentary anyway, TV shows, um, with very tiny disclaimers at the end after the credits. And so um, whenever they air this, this fake mermaid documentary, we get I get probably about uh, 100 emails from people being like, hey, are mermaids real? Are you hiding evidence for mermaids? No, no, I'm not. Why would I do that? That would be awesome if it were true. <laughs> yeah? So is it, is it possible that novel science bloggers proactively reach out to existing science, science writers, journalists, and push your pieces to the public? Absolutely. Um, if you've written something that you think is fantastic, if you've got a little blog pest, blog blogspot blog, sorry, there's too many Bs in that one. If you've got a little blogspot blog, um, but you've written something you think is great and you don't have a huge audience, email me, email the big science journalists, email other science communicators, tweet directly at people. Um, yeah, we, uh, like, we, th these are all labors of love. I do this because I love sharing information the ocean. So if you've got information about the ocean for me, yes, I will absolutely share it. Uh, and most other people who write about the ocean will too. Um, so yeah, and this was another case where this went up um, while the documentary was airing, um, the very first time they aired it. Uh, and we were lucky because um, Animal Planet kind of, kind of, I won't say dropped the ball, but they released the documentary online on Amazon at the exact same time that they aired it. So we were able to get it on Amazon, go to the end of the documentary, find the disclaimers, and put pictures of the disclaimers up all over the internet before the documentary was even over. Um, which was great, because people got to actually see the disclaimers saying, nope, this is totally fake. Um, before it, even the uh, broadcast was over. This continues to plague us um, constantly. <laughs> the, the mermaid thing is just not going to go away. It's... Um, Mermaids are the new vampires. Just be ready for it. As as a marine science community, just prepare yourselves. Mermaids are the new vampires. Oh. I'm going to skip this one because some of you may have read that paper uh, later. But um, So, as I mentioned before, my main research is in uh, the conservation of hydrothermal events. Um, and if you go to Southern Fried Science, there are actually very few articles written about hydrothermal event conservation, and that is uh, for a very specific reason. Um, during the entire course of my PhD career, and even today, uh, I was working with regulatory agencies, with uh, international NGOs, uh, and with the United Nations International Seabed Authority to help craft um, policy for the conservation of hydrothermal events and other deep sea 
resources uh, in the wake of the almost certain future of deep sea mining, which is always about five years away. Um, and it's been about five years away for my entire career. Um, <laughs> but it really is five years away this time. Um, no, I'm, I actually, uh, if you want to talk about it over lunch, I'm happy to show you some of the actual mining tools they've got. They're terrifying. Um, but because I was actually working behind the scenes on, on helping craft regulations, it was very important not to post excessively about my actual research. Um, so generally speaking, the only times I ever write about my actual research are when peer-reviewed publications come out and are published in the mainstream literature so that I have that authority to fall back on. Um, and this is important because of this, this point right here. Uh, as soon as you start writing about science for an audience that is not exclusively your scientific peers, and often even if you are, uh, you're an activist. Uh, at the very minimum, you're an activist for scientific literacy. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, you may just be an activist for your own research program to get people to know you're there. Um, you might be an activist for a specific piece of data, but as soon as you start publishing online, you are in some way an activist. Um, and once you start um, taking a stand on specific issues, that colors the way certain people will interpret your work. Um, and that is a real danger for uh, especially young grad students who start blogging. Um, it can hurt your career if you aren't careful and diplomatic about what you write. Um, I'm going to try not... I, I, I have a couple specific examples, but I probably don't want to bring them up if we're recording this, but I, I can share some specific examples uh, later on. Um, but uh, just be careful. Um, know the political field you're entering into, and an academic institution is a political field. Um, there are PIs and deans and academics who think that blogging is a waste of time, and if you're blogging, you're not serious about science. Uh, that is a risk that um, you should simply acknowledge if, if you decide to go into science blogging or science writing. Um, you just have to be aware of that. Um, that's not to discourage anyone. I think it's a fantastic thing. It's been tremendously rewarding. I have actually gotten feedback from job applications where they say we can't hire you because of your blogging. Um, so it does have real tangible effects on, on, on your potential career prospects. Um, if you want to be career Noah, you probably don't want to start a blog that is as conservation politically slanted as Southern Fried Science. You might want to stick to writing purely about research. Um, you know, just be strategic about your topics uh, and have a plan. Don't, don't dive into it blind. Know kind of the directions that you want to take. Um, that being said, it's been tremendously successful. We've gotten a lot of the International Seabed Regulations passed. I've gotten to write about it quite a bit, and it's really fun. Um, so this is kind of the arc of Southern Fried Science, and there's actually, there's obviously like four years back that we don't have data for, because that was on the old uh, WordPress platform, and I actually have the data, but it's on my computer that's in San Francisco, and when I went to make the slide, I was like, oh, I forgot that Excel spreadsheet. Um, but so this is about the, the trajectory. And you can see it's kind of a low, um, long climb. It took four years to get to that first million unique visitors. Uh, it took two years to get to the four millionth unique visitor. Um, so, you know, you don't get discouraged the first year when it's just your mom and your PI and the other two people writing on your blog that are visiting your blog. That's just that's just how it is. You have to build um, you just have to build an archive of content and that's what will ultimately drive traffic to your site. Lots of lots of good consistent content um, over the course of a year, over the course of many years and a solid track record is how you get to the size of the audience that you would want if you were Southern Fried Science. Now not everyone wants to be Southern Fried Science. Um, it actually 
as this audience grows, the amount of time you have to invest into the system grows. Um, and actually, at this point, it's probably about 80% uh, tech support, 20% writing on my end. Um, fortunately, I've got another eight writers that, that also contribute to the blog. But because we're independently hosted, um, because we have a lot of, of our own software running on it, most of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis for Southern Fried Science is making sure that the uh, servers keep chugging along and not necessarily getting content in. So another, that's just another thing to think about. If, if you want your science writing to get big, you have to learn how to run a website as well. Um, well, on the other hand, you can leave it on a free platform, and the free platform will handle all of that. You just won't have very much control over your layout or, or things like that. Um, the other thing we do is um, a strong social media presence. Um, so there's a Southern Fried Science Facebook page with uh, quite a few followers. Um, all of our writers have Twitter accounts. Uh, primarily used to have conversations with other scientists. Um, people are often surprised by... Um, Twitter is a thing that has a lot of uses, and a lot of them are, are very banal. Um, and those are the things that everyone always talks about with, why would you bother doing this? It's just people posting pictures of their sandwiches. Uh, <laughs> which is true. People do post pictures of their sandwiches a lot. But people also talk about scientific issues. Um, People reach out to their colleagues. Um, I have several papers that emerged from collaborations that started over discussions on Twitter. Um, so it is a very, very strong tool for network building. Um, and if you want to waste an afternoon looking at pictures of sandwiches, you can also do that. Um, but so we have a strong social media presence, and that helps drive a lot of attention to our blog. That allows us to reach out to more people, uh, and it helps us build connections throughout the online ocean community, which um, the ocean community online lives on Twitter. That's kind of just the reality of the situation right now. Um, so in the background of the story of Southern Fried Science is also the story of science blogging in general, because um, we really entered the field uh, during a very um, a major transitory period for the, the science blogging world. And this is broader than just ocean science blogging, although Deep Sea News is actually probably the most visited science blog of any sort on the internet right now. Um, but when we started uh, this one site, Science Blogs, um, controlled the, the science blogging world. Probably 90% of all the red science blogs out there were on this site, uh, including Deep Sea News, which which slowly left. So it was, it was a very nice, tight collection of blogs. And so that made it very, very hard for new sites to break in because everyone was just going to this one place uh, to get all their science-related content. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what side you were on, uh, science blogs kind of imploded in 2009. Um, and an interesting thing happened. The kind of rest of the general science blogging world uh, split off into all of these uh, tight little groups. Uh, Scientopia was a lot of people who left science blogs. Occam's Typewriter was all the, the bloggers from Nature had its own blogging network, which has had its own ups and downs, but a lot of people from Nature went to this one, Occam's Typewriter. Uh, Lab Spaces grabbed a bunch of them, and then Scientific American launched its own blogging network. So it kind of, the, the overall science blogging world kind of split into all of these little sub, um, websites. Um, but in contrast, um, the ocean blogging community kind of coalesced around uh, Deep Sea News and uh, Southern Fried Science. So um, when all this was going on, there were a ton of really, really great uh, ocean science blogs. There was uh, the Oysters Garter, uh, Malaria, Bedbug, Sea Lice, and Sunset, which I'm actually amazed I managed to get all of that right. It's probably the first time I've done that. Um, and a whole host of other ones. There's the Right Blue, the Natural Patriot. Um, but as all of this was falling apart, um, Deep Sea News kind of absorbed a bunch of them. Southern Fried Science kind of absorbed a bunch of them. So now we've got the situation where um, there's really two or three places you can go and get all the great ocean science blogging content, which is Deep Sea News and Southern Fried Science. Um, and then there's uh, Sea Monster, which is run by John Bruno, which is good, but doesn't post very frequently. Um, so they all kind of congealed, and we kind of came to realize that uh, as 
ocean science communicators, we were far more effective as, as a single aggregate than as a bunch of dispersed blogs. Um, so we just started absorbing uh, anyone who wanted to to write and was a good writer and had had a decent track record ended up joining uh, Deep Sea News or Southern Fried Science or a couple of of the other ones. Um, but because of that, we started building this nice big community of bloggers that were all centered around a few sites, so that it was kind of a one-stop shop for ocean science content, um, which is great. It's also great that there are tons of other blogs out there too. Um, but having just a few places where you know there's a dedicated audience that shows up every time um, is really helpful. So as people just getting started out in science blogging or people running other science blogs, um, ask to write guest posts, ask to cross post. Um, Craig McLean runs Deep Sea News, I run Southern Fried Science. We love it when people say, hey, I wrote this cool thing on my blog, can I cross post it to yours and we'll provide link backs and help drive traffic and boost your profile. Uh, we love when that happens. Um, and we've actually, in, in, in a few cases, those, those guest posts have actually ended up with us just saying, hey, just why don't you just come, come write for us full time? Um, which is great because one of the big problems with maintaining a blog is keeping the content consistent. You need to have something new on there uh, every couple of days to, to keep your audience interested. And when it's just one person, that's very, very hard to do, especially when it's one person who's a graduate student or an early career scientist or someone who's got a lot of other priorities as well. Um, so having nine people, ten people writing means that you can write once a month once every couple of weeks, uh, and your content gets seen because uh, there's an audience that keeps coming back because there's always fresh content. Um, so keep that in mind. We, we love guest posts. Deep Sea News loves guest posts if you'd rather write for them. Um, there, there's no rivalry between the two of us. We, we coordinate quite a bit, um, and, and we're happy to welcome new people into the science blogging world. Um, so that gets into the next topic, which is expect surprises. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So I am currently, no, I'm not doing this full time. Um, I'm currently science writing full time um, as a freelance science writer and as a contractor for an NGO called Upwell that does uh, ocean conservation outreach. Um, so I don't do Southern Fried Science full time, but I do do online ocean communication full time uh, at the moment. Yep. How often do you publish uh, your pieces when you just started blogging for South Atlantic Science? Uh, I tried to get one out a week, um, and some weeks were better than others. Um, there were a couple of months where we where it was just me and David Schiffman, and we got out 100 posts, and there were a couple of months where we'd get out none, um, because of course that ebbs and flows with what's going on in your, your real life as opposed to your internet life. Um, so it, it varies quite a bit, um, and obviously a lot of our early growth was stunted by the fact that we weren't constantly putting out content, which, I mean, two people can't constantly put out content um, unless that's what you're doing with your life. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. That. Cool. Um, so, geeks love superhero science. Um, and the worse you are to a superhero, the more they love it. So the original title for this, this was the first article we wrote that got syndicated to a bunch of other sites. Um, io9 is a science fiction and futurist website, um, which is kind of tangential to what we do, but reached a totally different audience than what Southern Fried Science would reach, um, which was fantastic. Um, but the original title for this article, they, they ended up changing it because when you editors write headlines and journalists write copy um, in the real world. In the blogging world, you get to write your own headlines, but this, this got written by an editor. The original headline was uh, The Horrifying Physiologic and Psychologic Consequences of Being Aquaman. <laughs> and it was all about the fact that human bodies aren't really designed to work in the ocean and all the terrible, terrible, terrible things that would happen to them if you tried to live there. Um, this was a huge article. Um, for me personally, and and for the website, and it, it really it opened my eyes to the idea that we need to be looking at um, communities tangential to our own, where we can kind of reach in and share our experience with. So this was uh, 
you know, the comic book geek uh, science fiction community, maybe they don't necessarily think about ocean issues, but they do like making fun of Aquaman. Um, so, and this was, despite the title and, and the pictures we show, which is Aquaman throwing a polar bear at poachers. Um, sure. Uh, but um, this was probably one of the harder science uh, pieces I wrote couched within this sort of comic book narrative because we got into like what happens to sperm whales when they dive um, and how does heat transfer work and uh, how many tuna would Aquaman need to eat every day to maintain his metabolism. He actually needs to eat 64,000 calories a day um, which is 62 kilograms of tuna Something like that. The, the math is in there, down there somewhere. But that was tremendously fun to write. And it, it got huge attention because it was a little different. Um, so geeks love superhero science. That was one of the many surprises we got. Um, googly eyes uh, make everything better. Um, so this is a, a side project to Southern Fried Science. It's part of the Southern Fried Science Empire. But it's a very, very simple website called Deep Sea Fauna with googly eyes. <laughs> and it is exactly that. And when I created this website, I had one very specific goal in mind. I wanted people who don't think about the deep sea at all to think a little bit more about the deep sea um, using the most basic possible content that would get someone to engage with a deep sea animal that would never in their life look up a Grimpatuthis, I think is what that species is. Um, and the simplest way to do it is stick googly eyes on it. This thing went crazy. This, this website gets a, about 100,000 hits a day. Um, it is unbelievable how popular that got. And it is, this is it, literally, this is, well, so this isn't what the website looks like, but this is basically what the website looks like. It is incredibly simple. Um, on the other end of getting a little more complicated uh, is another project we did called Drown Your Town. Um, and this is a uh, plugin for Google Earth that allows you to simulate sea level rise anywhere in the world. Um, so we launched this project in a um, interactive request model. So it, it started on Twitter with the, um, we have a sea level rise simulator. Tell us where you live and we'll tell you how much the sea would need to rise in order to flood it. And we'll create an image for you. And Google Earth is great like that because it's got... 3D maps of major uh, monuments and most cities in it. So when you do this in Google Earth, you get these nice 3D renderings of buildings underwater. Um, and so that took off huge. A lot of people um, uh, really, really connected with it because it was a way to connect something um, global and abstract, like climate change, to something very concrete. Like, this is your hometown underwater. Um, and we were, we were careful uh, to make sure that we were giving people correct information. Um, we flooded anything. Someone wanted to see Reno, Nevada underwater. So we're like, yes, sure, 16,000 meters of sea level rise. Let's do it. It's Reno. Um, but in doing that, we also said, all right, let's talk about what we can really expect, uh, what the current predictions actually are. You know, obviously the world is not going to flood all the way up to Reno, no matter how much you want it to. Um, but we are going to experience some sea level rise. And we did some more realistic projections. This is actually one of, um, this is actually a projection of Fort Monroe National Monument. A paper came out um, a couple months ago that just listed all of the um, U.S. national monuments that were threatened by climate change. Uh, and so we went through and we pulled out all the ones that were listed as um, threatened by sea level rise because some of them were threatened by wildfires and other things. And then we simulated all of the U.S. national monuments that would be threatened by sea level rise in the next century and made the um, projections. Uh, we also did it for the Super Bowl. Um, that ended up getting retweeted about 6,000 times. Um, so the Super Bowl stadium this year was located about a meter above sea level. So we could actually flood it and be like, no, this is actually within current projections. Um, and so that, that, that got a lot of attention. Um, but so things like this, this... Um, there's a whole separate narrative about this one, how this project evolved that I, I won't get into now. But this uh, took me completely by surprise. Um, when I originally developed the model, I was doing it totally different. Made a cool picture of San Francisco under 80 meters of sea level rise. Um, shared it on Twitter being like, hey, look, isn't this hilarious? And all of a sudden, everyone's like, that's cool. Can you know where I live? Um, so that's how that kind of grew out of 
just this totally unexpected thing. Do you get yep. uh, um, inquiries about uh, um, from insurance companies, legal? Um, uh, not for this because it's um, some of the Google Earth has a lot of limitations. Uh, you can only do it in one meter increments. Um, the way that Google codes its topology is not perfect. So you'll actually find places where there are like really distinct, like straight, jagged lines. Um, and that's just because Google Earth has kind of borked the topology of the area. There's a couple islands in the South Pacific that Google says are 46 meters below sea level, um, which makes it very hard to simulate sea level rise on them because the database is, is not perfect. Um, so it's, we, we, we were very careful to say, this is not a real estate projection. This is uh, a way to visualize sea level rise in an entertaining way. Uh, these are not, not strictly, and for, for most of them, we actually, we vet them. We go find the real projections for the, for the local areas and make sure that we're not totally misrepresenting things. But we, we let people know that this is not perfect. <laughs> um, so another, another surprise for me is I moved out to, to San Francisco earlier this year. Um, and ended up getting involved with a community that did a lot of work with these quadcopter drones, these little autonomous uh, hover drones that were in the news recently because someone was flying them through Fourth of July fireworks. Um, cool video, probably a terrible idea. Um, but so I got involved with this because I was talking to, um, we're working on developing environmental sensor modules for the drones so that you can do things like water quality sampling. Um, and in the course of this, we started asking, like, well, how do drones and AUVs apply to the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And it turns out there's no specific guidelines. So uh, I ended up doing a whole series of articles um, and interviews um, looking into kind of the legal status of drones to be used for things like whale watching. Um, and as it actually turns out, according to the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Marine Mammal Commission, um, any use of drones near, near a whale is totally a violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, it's it's com it's t completely unambiguous, but it's also um, not widely known. Uh, a lot of people are doing things like using drones to film whales for like whale watches and stuff. Um, the problem is that, um, as far as the MMPA is concerned, drones are aircrafts. Aircrafts can't fly below a thousand meters if they're near near whales. Um, as far as the FAA is concerned. Drones are unregistered model aircrafts and can't fly above 400 feet. Um, so you actually can't legally fly a drone anywhere near a whale. Um, but a lot of people are doing it, and so I put out a whole set of guidelines to kind of help people not go to jail and lose their drones. Um, and then it being Southern Fried Science, I can't not mention that, that we do a lot of shark blogging. Um, my dominant co-blogger, David Schiffman, who does... About a quarter of all the writing on the blog um, is, a, is a big time shark conservation blogger. Um, and so we get a lot of shark stuff out there. Um, to get something to go really viral, people love sharks. People love good news stories about the oceans. If you've got both, um, it goes crazy. This thing, this article, and it's, it's only about 500 words, um, but it was a cool little article about a um, guy caught a world record shark, decided instead of bring it into port to get an official weight, he'd let it go. Um, pretty simple article. Um, nice story. People like hearing about things like that. Uh, 60,000 visitors the first day it launched um, and consistently held up for another two or three weeks. Um, so, you know, these are the kinds of stories people really like to hear. People, there is so much doom and gloom in ocean conservation that if you've got a good news story, you should share it because Otherwise, people begin getting um, uh, catastrophe fatigue. Um, they get tired of hearing constantly about how much we're destroying the world without ever hearing about any of the, the good things that occasionally happen. Um, we are... I'd say five minutes. Um, okay. Trolls, I'll go quickly on this. Because um, this is... And I'll, I'll stop after this one because this is kind of important. Um, there used to be in the grand glory days of Usenet and Alternet and all the original um, kind of internet forums, this idea of trolls as people who are intentionally derailing conversations because they have fun messing with people. Uh, they exist still. There's not that many of them. Um, as science, there are turkeys out there. 
Um, as science bloggers, we have a very small audience for the rest of the internet. We really don't experience what people think of generally as trolls. What we do experience are these three things. Um, people who are mo emotionally invested in discrediting specific topics. Um, so there's a lot of people that don't want anyone to talk about climate change, and they will let you know um, often and vocally on, on websites if you do a lot of blogging about climate change. Uh, true for evolution, and then there's, that's true for a lot of niche topics as well. Um, there are honest dissenters, people who are legitimately, um, they are in good faith saying, I don't quite agree, I want to have a discussion. Um, and then there are these things called managed personas. And if you do any work in, if you talk about climate change, if you talk about regulating the oil industry, uh, if you talk about a couple other kind of big hot button political issues, uh, most of what you think of as trolls are actually to be these managed personas. And this is a real thing. Um, this is just a description of what the program Entrepid does. This is what the um, U.S. government uses for its um, major astroturfing campaigns in the Middle East. But this piece of software, which you can go to Entrepid's website and, and download it and buy it and use it, it's, it's totally just, it's a thing. But it allows one operator to anonymously create and control up to 10 personas from one computer. Each persona has a background history supporting details and cyber presence that is consistent from a technical, cultural, and geographic standpoint. It's a way to um, shape the online conversation using artificial participants. Um, we've found two people using, doing this on Southern Fried Science. Um, I got one guy to just flat out say, yeah, I'm using Intrepid on these six people in your comment thread. Um, Realistically, you won't actually experience this very often unless you get very big uh, as a website. Uh, most of what you'll actually see are honest dissenters. Um, and so it's important to never think of your commenters as trolls, but always think of them as an opportunity to continue educating the public. Um, if you get particularly horrifying, vicious comments, you just delete them. Just They don't exist. You are free to delete whatever comment you don't like. Um, and you should. You should manage your comment threads to make sure that it's a productive and open dialogue that's not full of um, people spewing uh, garbage at you. Um, but this is very important because you can't tell which of these is which for the most part. Um, and my general approach is to always assume good faith um, uh, on the part of the commenters. Yeah. Do you approve prior to comments going on or do you want them to go and then... We have a first time approval. Um, so the very first time you comment on the website, it has to get approved by a moderator. After that, you can comment however and as often as you want. And that, that will filter out 90% of the, the total fly-by-night crap that people try to, try to spew out there. Um, OK, moving quickly. Big picture. Um, so this is, is kind of a concept that I've, I've sort of alluded to as I've been talking about the way I shape my content. This is what I call the wedge of outreach. Um, and basically what it is is that the deeper your content, the more detailed, the more rigorously scientific it is, um, the more uh, hard science, uh, the more agony, uh, the lower your potential reach. Um, so, you know, when you're, you're tailoring a blog that's, that's designed to have a broad interest, uh, you want to capture kind of all of the edges of this wedge. Um, you want deep content. You want people who get um, hooked um, by simple things. I want someone who sees a giant isopod with googly eyes to go, that's cool, I want to know more about giant isopods, and then have the resources to go find out more about them, and then have the resources to go find the papers about them. So it's a sort of stepwise process. Uh, and that gets into the second half of this ax axis, which is uh, activation energy. It's how much energy your audience is willing to invest in a piece of content in order for them to engage with it. So as that depth of content goes up, as you get uh, more more rigorous content, uh, the activation energy necessary for your audience uh, goes up as well. So it takes a lot of effort for someone in the general public to be like, okay, I want to read a scientific paper. Like, you have to invest quite a bit of effort into reading that, whereas it takes almost no effort to be like, I want to look at a picture of my town underwater. Um, so the real challenge and um, what I, I always try to think about in the back of my mind as I'm producing any content is how do we take people, this big audience that we catch here with the very low activation energy, and how do we just push them down the axis as much as possible? Uh, and you do that by engaging them every step of the way. 
uh, with new content, with content that goes a little bit deeper, with content that keeps them entertained um, and educated. And that's really sort of the entire, uh, oh, we're at the end, cool. That's really the kind of gist of what I do. Um, and we are only over by five minutes, which we got started 15 minutes late, so yes. <laughs>